All right, there we go. Um, oh, I should show my video. Even though they've all seen me, they still want to keep seeing me. Um, all right, so, you know, again, this is who I am. So for the recording, um, I'll at least leave the slide up here so they can go ahead and read through it. I know this audience is the same audience, so I won't uh, um, go back through that. Um, again, same thing. What stuff does the department have? Same uh, stuff we had before, but uh, do read through this if you are one of our listening audience. Uh, same thing with the faculty. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez does want to make another cameo <laughs> on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this, this guy's, he's a doll. <laughs> just, just so everybody's clear on that. And I'm aware of that. <laughs> All right. So our undergrad program in computer science, um, we have a, it's a 54 total credit program. Um, so you have 14 courses in the technology core. Uh, and I can go ahead and share that here real quick. And Mike, I don't know if you saw in the chat, but someone is interested in learning more about the Scholars Program. Yep, and that's on here. Great. That's on here. Uh, so let's see. Let me share this. And this one. Actually, let me share it differently than that. There you go. Um, okay, well, so I'll, I'll mention the scholars program here because it's right at the beginning. So this is our, our uh, flyer for the uh, uh, undergraduate uh, program. So we, uh, we have a scholars program that for incoming students who have a 3.5 high school GPA and at least a 25 ACT or 1200 SAT, um, you can apply for our scholars program. Uh, and what this guy is, it's, it's an aggressive program that allows you to uh, complete a undergraduate and graduate degree in computer science in four years for the cost of a four-year degree so what you were going to pay for an undergrad four-year degree you now get a master's out of that as well um, now truth in advertising you're taking really heavy loads you're taking full uh, full loads every single semester and you're probably going to also have to take a class in the summer and a class over winter um, uh, several different times um, so it's aggressive but you know, if your goal is to uh, get the most bang for your buck, it's the, you know, the way you can accomplish it. And the reason we have the uh, academic requirements for it is, you know, we want to set you up to succeed when you come to Concordia. And, um, you know, not that GPA or ACT and SAT means everything, but it is an indicator of, you know, whether or not you might be able to handle that, that level of uh, coursework, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, setting yourself up to fail and, and maybe not doing well. Um, so in any case, that's the, uh, uh, the deal with the scholars program. Now, all of our undergrad students can do an early start in the master's program. So they can kind of aggressively project towards that. So in their senior year, they can take up to four uh, of our graduate courses during their senior year. And that might be a little tight to squeeze in. So you, you have to plan for it. Um, but uh, uh, that would allow you to get both degrees in five years. So you'd be mostly, and actually it's even your the last semester. If you've got four classes done during your senior year of undergrad, you would be able to do the master's in um, one and a half semesters, let's say. You would have the uh, A and B session of the next year and then only the A session of the following one. So you can finish it in um, a semester and a half, let's say. So still pretty aggressive if you want to take advantage of the early start and that's open to all students. You don't have to qualify for that. You just have to work with your advisor to, to schedule for it, to make sure you have the openings. Um, so similar to our master's program, there's a technology core uh, that you take uh, for, this is for all computer science majors, regardless of which concentration you go into. So the first two classes you take, you'll take your very, your fall semester, your very first semester uh, is 175. So this is kind of an overview of computer science, overview of all of our concentrations. So in that, you'll look at 
topics from software engineering, AI and robotics, cybersecurity, computer animation, and information systems. So it's kind of a survey of what we have to offer. So maybe by, you know, you kind of get a taste for what you might like and what you might hate and that kind of stuff. Um, at the same time, you'll also take our very first programming class. I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, today as well. Um, so right off the bat, you're getting overview of computer science and you're getting programming one. I've never programmed before. So we assume you have zero programming experience, zero background. And uh, um, if you have some, that's great. You'll still learn something. Uh, like I said, I teach all the programming classes and I've been doing this for a few minutes. So uh, um, uh, one issue we have in, uh, um, you know, I mentioned in the other lecture with, you know, that we like power tools and we're used to Google and things like that. So when you kind of self teach yourself uh, computer programming, or you, you had it in a high school class where, you know, typically high school teachers are cross-trained, right? You know, these are folks that are teaching multiple different subjects and maybe they move into a, a specialty or something like that. But even, you know, they're having to teach themselves the computer programming stuff because they didn't necessarily go to school for that. You know, they, they are trying to add a computer science program to the high school. So you might also not necessarily be getting all the behind the scenes details. Um, there as well. So one risk you have uh, coming into a programming class when you already have given yourself a background in programming is that you don't know what you don't know. So you have this perception that you already know how to program because you're pretty good at writing software with the tools that you already understand. But since you haven't been exposed to some other tools, it's easy for you to assume they're not important when two or three semesters later, it'll come up that, oh, there was something that you didn't understand a long time ago that has now come to bite you in the butt or something like that. So I promise everybody will learn something in that class. Um, okay, so this is what you take right off the bat. Uh, 200, 250, and 300 are our programming sequence. So those are the, the three programming classes. This is coding one, coding two, coding three. Um, uh, everybody will take the first two programming classes and then only if you are software engineering or AI and robotics concentration will you take the third one. Uh, everybody will have a computer architecture class, an operating system class, a software engineering. Um, this is like an ethics computational dilemmas uh, type course. Uh, user experience, database, advanced database and web stuff. Um, Everybody does a giant capstone project the fall semester of their senior year. So this is a big 300 uh, hour project um, that uh, everybody does. You work with a client and you, you knock out this big project and the idea is that it goes, you know, it's something you can put on your resume and use as you're applying for jobs to say, hey, I did something real. Here's a big, big thing I did. Um, we also require an internship in the program. so. You, uh, you know, we typically recommend you start your internship like your sophomore year, but we have freshmen who uh, do internships. And, you know, I, I can tell you, there's no better way of learning than an internship. I think it's a, a truth to say that 90% of what you'll learn is not in the classroom. What the classroom will give you is it'll give you a framework for learning and it'll give you the um, uh, kind of the, the talking points that you're going to be exploring in computer science, but the effort you put in outside the classroom is what, what it's gonna, where it's gonna really count. That's something I'm gonna talk about today with, with programming languages. Um, so we're gonna be getting into that here in a few minutes. Uh, and then everybody has to take a statistics class uh, and then any computer science elective. So that's our technology uh, core. Um, then you pick one of these concentrations. I'm going to say at least one of these concentrations. One is required because, you know, the idea for this program is this. As the chair of computer science, you know what? I want you to spend as much money as possible on computer science classes. I want you fill in the seats in my classes and stuff like that. But I also want you to, you know, follow your God given path. And, you know, one thing that sometimes happens in college is you get stuck into taking a whole bunch of classes that you may or may not be interested in and you aren't given the wiggle room to maybe go and explore some other things. So one of the things we built into this program is you have 21 free electives. Um, now, what I hope is that most of you are interested in computer science enough that you'll just choose 
a second concentration and go and do uh, uh, a second concentration in computer science and use a good chunk of these 21 credits for that. But if that doesn't interest you, or there's some other areas you want to explore, like astronomy or psychology or biology, you know, whatever it is, you have seven classes that you can go and take that have nothing to do with the university's core and have nothing to do with computer science. So there's a lot of flexibility there for you to follow some of your passions that are outside of your exact degree program, all right? So that comes built in with our major is you have 21 free electives, we do not require you to do a minor. Minors would say, yes, you have 18 credits you have to do, but you have, it's a specific 18 credits. You can use these 21 credits however you wanna use them. I encourage you to use them in the second concentration. <laughs> All right, so in any case, you'll pick one of our five concentrations, at least one. We have a concentration in software engineering, artificial intelligence and robotics. And one thing you might notice here, and this kind of goes towards this, uh, um, uh, the second concentration thing, you'll notice that these two guys, AI, robotics, and software engineer are very related. There's some overlap there. 300 is required in both of them. Um, and you can actually pretty easily achieve both of these concentrations and still have some free electives left over. And over on the AI side, you end up taking a uh, machine learning and robotics course, which is really cool. Um, and you know, if you kind of think about where the world is going right now, AI is going to be huge. And machine learning and uh, uh, data science stuff, these are all things that are, are, are going to be high paying and very much in demand even now, but even more so, so moving forward. Um, in the software engineering, you do a systems programming class, language theory, and then a theoretical computer science uh, class. We also have a cybersecurity. Um, uh, concentration, which is also very popular, um, you know, and when you think about industry right now, cybersecurity is also a big deal. If you had to pick two buzzwords in uh, computer science industry, it would probably be artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Software engineering has been around for a while. That's not going anywhere, right? So maybe he's not the cool kid anymore, but he, he pays the bills. Um, but uh, AI and robotics are going to be a big deal. Cybersecurity is going to be a big deal. Um, those are huge up and coming and already here, so you're not gonna hurt yourself going into any of those. We also have kind of a, this would be a very specialized type of concentration called computer animation. Um, we have uh, Dr. Wall in the department is uh, an expert in animation, really gifted. So this is something that a lot of computer science programs would not be able to offer. Uh, so if you're interested in computer animation, making 3D models, 3D animations, uh, for like the video game industry or, or marketing or whatever, these are uh, pretty popular uh, classes for that. We get a lot of students who are outside of computer science taking these as part of their electives. And then our kind of our built-in IT major is information systems, uh, where you kind of dabble in cybersecurity, networking, and then some more programming. So this is really a hybrid degree of software engineering, cybersecurity, um, yeah, probably those two. And then some specialized cybersecurity stuff. In fact, actually there's an, oh no, here's penetration testing right here, yeah. So there's multiple cybersecurity classes here. Penetration testing is a cool class that's uh, um, called white hat hacking. You are effectively learning how to be a hacker. Because the idea is if you're gonna protect a computing system from uh, getting hacked, you have to know what the hackers are gonna do. So ethical hacking, white hat hacking is the, the idea there. So in any case, that's our undergraduate uh, uh, program in computer science. So we do have more concentrations in the undergrad program than we have in the grad program just because of the nature of it. Um, but that's the, uh, the scoop um, with that guy. So as I bring up my slides again, does anybody have any specific questions about the uh, uh, undergrad program before I Move just on. Like, two things. One, they wanted to know if um, they could um, have two, at least two concentrations, which you've already answered. Yes, you certainly you can. You can actually fit three. If you're strategic, you can get three in there. <laughs> Ooh, he, you go up to three. That, that brings a lot more flexibility in. And then also, I, you guys have a hackathon club. Do you head up the hackathon club? Uh, well, I'm the faculty advisor for the hackathon club. We have a student, I mean, so the club is a, is a student-run organization. So uh, this year, the student was Josh Appel, 
Um, next year, I think it's Jonathan Yakima is the, the head of it, but it's a student who runs it, but it goes through the department. And uh, the hackathon club, they uh, they travel around the country. Um, well, we do lo we hold our own local hackathons, and then we also uh, um, go to some of the other hackathons that are in the the, the bigger areas, so Milwaukee, Chicago, and uh, Madison. Uh, but we've also traveled around the country. We've gone to New York City for hackathons. We've gone to Raleigh, North Carolina, for hackathons. Um, so big, doing big road trips, things like that. And if you aren't familiar with hackathons, they're effectively programming competitions where you uh, you go there, you they give you some sort of criteria, you spend 24 hours straight writing some software uh, that does something. And the way we do it is we build, we, we create the teams before we go there and we try to, uh, we encourage all of our students, even your first semester beginning programming student to get involved in that kind of stuff. Because you, like I said earlier, um, you know, 90% of what you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn outside the classroom. So that 24 hours, you learn a lot. Uh, even if you're just chair surfing or shoulder surfing, right? So we try to create a group that has maybe a couple of upperclassmen in it and then a couple of freshmen, sophomores. So, you know, the beginners and then the more advanced students that used to be the beginners. And because uh, we want you to have a good educational experience, not necessarily be on a team that wins. Um, you know, it is what it is, but we want these to be great learning experiences. Uh, because I'll tell you what, you know, you, you win the, uh, the wireless keyboard or something like that at one of these things, you know, life will go on if you don't win the keyboard. Um, you know, sometimes the big prize is like an Xbox or something like that. Um, and there is a big competition that we've done, which was like a $100,000 grand prize and stuff. But I mean, in general, they're educational experiences. Um, about how to work under pressure. Wow. Yeah, but I mean, even then, I mean, you, you know, you go in with the idea that the chances of winning are, are relatively low because it, it's it's very arbitrary. You know, it's not like it's a very strict point system. You have a panel of judges that they listen to your pitch at the end and decide, you know, was it something that they liked personally or not? So you might have a team that did something technically the best, but didn't come, their presentation didn't make it sound as, as enticing or something like that. Been seeing a, I'm sensing some emotion there, some history perhaps. Uh, yeah, but I've always looked at it as an educational opportunity. You know, you create your, you create your own successes. I don't think you need to win through uh, um, hackathons. I think students should really view them as educational opportunities and not a way to get prize money. Uh, there are actually p people whose entire career is they travel around to hackathons around the country as like a team of people that are, you know, like professional developers specifically to win cash prizes at hackathons. It's like, a, you know, that, that's how they make their living. And, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. So you got to consider as a student going into these things that you're going to have folks like that at these things. So your chances of winning aren't necessarily great, but your chances of learning are 100 percent, you know, and so you win every time if you look at it that way. Okay. So, and so I had our thing in here for our MSCS program as well related to the scholars program. So if you do both programs, you're gonna have to meet all the criteria of this one as well in those four years. None of the classes are double dipping. You're, you know, if you're gonna do the scholars program, you will complete all of the undergraduate computer science uh, requirements as well as all of the graduate computer science requirements. There's no like trade-off where one class counts double or anything. So we squeeze it all into those four years, which like I said, it's an aggressive four years. And maybe if you're going to, um, you know, not that you can't be a student athlete or you can't, you know, have the college experience partying and things like that, but you know, you're gonna want your main focus to be on academics if you're gonna look at the scholars program. So it's it's not necessarily for everyone, but it's, it's there. Um, okay, so what I wanna talk about for a little bit today is this idea of computer programming. Now, if you're in the last session, I kind of talked about, you know, I mentioned computer programming, but I talked about it from the perspective of, you know, using the right tool for the job and specifically talking more about the low, the low level hardware of the offerings of the computer, we're talking about, we're talking to the CPU. Well, in this case, I wanna talk about the next level up, right? So as a human being, so I used the example earlier that, you know, as human beings, we, we have 
20 plus years of experience talking to other human beings. Um, so what are we going to do? You know, when, when we go up to a human being, we immediately agree upon a, um, you know, a, a language, right? You know, so if, if I'm walking into a room and you're going to talk to me, we have to agree upon English because that's all I speak. Okay, so we choose a communication protocol. In, in my case, it might be English. And we're already practiced at talking to other human beings. So we're going to have that discussion with uh, other human beings using English as the communication protocol. Now, in the previous session, we talked about the language that at the end of the day, the computer only speaks binary. It only speaks zeros and ones. So one way or another, if a human being is gonna to talk to a computer, it's gonna to have to translate from what we say down to zeros and ones. We can either do that directly, which we don't wanna do. You're gonna have classes where we do do that to prove that you have a competency in it so you understand what's actually happening at the, at the computer level because as a computer scientist, we need to understand those things and it is fascinating but it's fascinating from the perspective that's maybe not something we wanna spend our daily lives doing. Instead, we wanna create power tools that live between us and that computer hardware that allows us to express ourselves more efficiently um, to the computer and then let some other tool that a computer programmer probably also created uh, translate that into the next level down which translates that into the next level down. So from a programming language perspective, we write stuff in a high level programming language that then goes through a, a compiler or interpreter which converts it to a low level programming language. And then it goes through an assembler which converts it to a uh, to machine language. And then it goes through a linker which makes it into an executable that runs on the actual CPU. So there's several different layers. You can think of it like a filter, right? If you have a water filter at home, you dump you know, whatever water came out of the faucet or, you know, has minerals or whatever, bad stuff in it, let's say, you dump it into this filter and it goes through a whole bunch of layers until it finally comes out as presumably clean water, okay? Same thing's true here. We program in a, you know, the, the, the human-like way and then we pass that code that we wrote through a bunch of filters and ultimately it spills out as zeros and ones, all right? but. And some human being had to write those filters, had to create those programs, but once they created it, we can now operate at the, uh, the high level. I used the example of automatic versus manual transmission in the, uh, the last talk. And, you know, same thing. I mean, we don't appreciate some of these things unless we've had to use some of the old way of doing things. I mean, um, you, know, you talk to your, uh, your, your grandparents, maybe, your great-great-grandparents uh, for uh, this age group. Um, you know, back then, you know, when they wanted to start their car, they had to get out in the rain or whatever and crank it in the front. The little handle, they had to crank the front of their car just to get the, the motor going. They didn't have this little electric turnkey ignition uh, ignition thing. They, you know, that didn't always exist. So you think about something like that we take for granted today where you, oh, I just get it and I turn the key. You know, and now we, we don't have to get in and turn the key. I keep my keys in my pocket because it has like a wireless thing. I could start my car from my house. I can actually start my car from anywhere I want. I can start it from an app. Um, you know, it's in the winter, I get up and I'm like, oh, well, I'm not gonna brush the snow off my car. I'll just start it an hour early and let it, <laughs> and let it heat up and, and melt the snow off. Um, so in order to appreciate all these newfangled things, we kind of have to know where we came from. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the idea here is that, you know, it's not that we don't want to appreciate uh, computer, uh, uh, you know, the, the computer itself, that CPU. The CPU is such an important part of our lives as computer scientists, that doesn't mean we wanna talk directly to it. As computer scientists, we should be able to talk directly to it if somebody forced us to. Every now and then we might need to go in and tweak something because that's we're the experts. We might we need to tweak something and actually have to operate at that level, but we're operating at, operating at that level for a very small window of the computer application that needs to be like extra fast or something like that. A majority of our time we're spending up at a high level programming language level, writing code that ultimately will get translated into zeros and ones by another program. All right, so a statement. Programming is a skill set. The language doesn't matter. I mentioned this before. Same thing's true today. I gave the example about our natural languages as humans. Whether we pick 
English, Telugu, Spanish, Portuguese, it doesn't matter. All of those languages are equally good at communicating with other human beings. We pick the language that's the right tool for a job, and when we're talking about human beings communicating, we pick the language that both people are proficient in, uh, or most proficient in, <laughs> let's say, um, and we hope that we can get the point across. Uh, with computers, we, a programmer might pick the language that they're most comfortable with, um, but I actually make the argument that as a programmer, you have the computer programming skill set already. So you might tend towards languages that you've used before, but you shouldn't do that out of, out of hand instead of saying, well, I'm going to need to use these couple of interesting features to solve the problem I'm going to solve. Are there some languages out there that have some innate conveniences related to those features? If I need to do a lot of networking, um, you know, talk or something like that, uh, maybe there's a couple of languages that have uh, uh, some convenient tools built into them that make something like that a little easier than some other language. So because you already know how to program, it shouldn't be a, a giant stretch for you to say, well, I'm going to take this language that I've never used before, and I'm going to pick that as my development language for this because it's going to allow me to solve that let's call it the difficult part of my problem a little bit easier and I'll learn that new language pretty quickly again because programming is the skill set not the, the language doesn't really matter all right um, so I start off with this idea of how do human beings solve problems okay we're professional problem solvers you know, in fact, most of us are so good at solving problems that we have trouble articulating how we solve them. You'll see that here in a, in a few minutes, okay? So I try to abstract the way that you know, human beings solve problems. We can sit there and debate it and probably come up with some other approaches or something like that. But, you know, in general, human beings, we lose, use our memory, we ask a lot of questions, and we do repetition, all right? So imagine if you couldn't have memory, you know, you know, there's people who have short term memory loss. They, you know, that they, they, they put that in movies and things like that, where you come in and somebody introduces themselves and two seconds later, they introduce themselves this again because they don't remember you. If we didn't have our memory, um, it becomes a very debilitating thing. It's something we rely on for our problem solving, even though many of us just take it for granted. Right. And even though some of us might say, oh, well, I don't have a great memory. All of us have wonderful memories in the big scheme of things, right? You know, you very rarely will forget your name or your phone number or your age. Although as you get older, you have to start calculating your age. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, you know, you got to count the rings. <laughs> one, one of the two. Um, you know, but the, the, the idea here is that memory is something that we heavily rely on for solving our problems. We also ask a lot of questions. In fact, we're so used to asking questions, sometimes you don't realize we're doing it. Day one of class, I usually ask the students, you know, how many of you got to class today without bumping in any walls? Something like that. And you get the couple of students like, oh yeah, you know, I bumped into walls. But when you really look at a, a community of people out there you know, in malls or in the hallways of the school or something like that, you know, they, they're, they're staring at their phone, texting and stuff like that, or playing a game while they're bobbing and weaving in and out of people, right? Okay. Think about what, what's happening at that level. You know, not only they, so they're walking, first of all, how complex is walking? It's incredibly complex. You got all these different muscles that have to fire in the right order and you're, you got to keep yourself from falling over to the left and falling over to the right and falling forward and falling backwards and, and uh, you know, all this stuff. So, you know, just the act of walking is something that we're so good at as human beings, we don't even think about it. You know, if you tried to teach somebody else how to walk, you, you it would be a very difficult thing because we don't think about how to walk. We just do it. We've been doing it so long and we're so great at it. We have trouble articulating how we do it. All right. And as you're walking down the hall, even though you're staring at your phone, playing your game or texting people, whatever it is, you're constantly asking those questions. Am I going to fall over to the left? Am I going to fall over to the right? Am I going to hit somebody? Do I need to change my, do I need to shift my weight every so ever so bit just to get myself angling towards the right? We don't even recognize that we're asking those questions, but as we kind of glance around as we're, as we're going, we are asking them and we're answering them and we're responding to those, uh, uh, those results 
uh, by shifting our weight, by changing ourselves, by glancing up, whatever it is. These are all things that we do, but we're so good at it. We do it so passively that we don't even recognize that we're doing it. Um, and then we use a lot of repetition, right? So we repeat a task over and over again until some problem is solved. So what I'm saying here is that if we were to abstract down the way human beings solve problems, we solve them using these three things, let's say. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that 100% of programming languages, so this goes back to this idea that programming is the skill set. The language doesn't matter. 100% of programming languages will have facilities for these three things. It'll have a way of dealing with memory, it'll have a way of asking questions, and it'll have a way of doing repetition every one of them okay so we have this thing called the mapping that i call it so 100 percent of the programming languages have facilities for these th these three things typically programming languages will emulate memory through variables these are just name value pairs like my name is mike my age is 21 if you believe that um you know so on and so on and so forth all right so um um Asking questions, we usually do this through something like a, called a conditional, an if statement. If this is true, do this. If this is false, do something else. Um, so that's built into every programming language. We also do repetition through loops. You know, as long as some condition is true, I'm gonna keep knocking on this door until somebody opens the door. So while the door is not open, I'm just gonna bang on it. That's what I'm doing, all right? This is repetition that's also built into our programming languages through for loops, while loops, do while loops, for each loops. Um, we also have something called functions, which are reusable chunks of code where, you know, if, uh, um, you know, all of us have all these little abilities in our head that we don't, that we take for granted. If I said, hey, what's five plus three? You know, you'll say, oh, well, that's eight. And then I say, oh, well, what's two plus two? Well, so that's four. So somewhere in your head, you have this little facility for like adding two numbers together, okay? I give you two numbers, you spit out one number as the result of those two being added together. That's a function, all right? So you can write things like that, that that emulate the way human beings already solve problems because the idea is that, you know, even though some of these things we have committed to memory, um, you know, two plus two, you probably just know is four. Five plus three, you probably just know is eight. But if I give you a couple of pretty large numbers, you know, you wouldn't have the answer memorized, but you would be able to solve it because you know how to take two numbers and add them together. You probably learned it in uh, first or second grade, something like that. You know, chances are you forgot some of that. <laughs> you gotta go back and uh, remember remember how it works. But, you know, the point is, is somewhere in your mind, you have a facility that given two numbers, add them together, you can work with any size numbers, all right? So those are our functions. So 100% of programming languages will have facilities for mimicking the way human beings already solve problems. Remember the job of the programming language is to allow us to talk to that CPU. Okay, so this guy is the tool that says, hey, you know what? You're human, this is how you already solve problems. I'm gonna give you the necessary tools to translate how you already solve problems into something that the computer will ultimately understand. Great. It's a power tool. Programming must be easy. No big deal. Everybody can do it. All right, now I already alluded to this. Why is programming hard? Well, I asked you, how do you walk? All of us would have trouble explaining how we actually accomplish walking. How did you get to class today without banging in any walls? Well, I just did. As human beings, we are so gifted we are so good at solving problems that we have a lot of trouble articulating how we solve them. How did you get to class today without bumping into any walls? I just did. I didn't even think about it. Even though if we if we pause for a second, we can we can agree that oh, we, I asked a lot of questions. Am I going to hit this person? Am I going to hit that person? Am I going to bump into any wall? I didn't really realize I asked them, but I must have asked. Them. You know, we can all kind of come to that conclusion, but. It's so uh, ingrained in us solving these daily problems that we don't really think about um, how to do it. You know, if, if I gave everybody, um, a, you know, a, a handful of change, and I said, okay, put all the quarters in one pile, all the dimes in another pile, all the nickels in another pile, you would just kind of do it. You wouldn't really think anything of it. And if I said, okay, well now write a computer program that can kind of do the same kind of sorting, 
you would have to slow yourself down and say, okay, well, what did I actually do to determine what was a quarter and what was a nickel and what was a dime? You know, because you just kind of skip past those three or four steps because we're so good at it. That's what makes programming hard. We have to retrain our mind to recognize that a computer doesn't know what a quarter is. A computer doesn't know what a calf muscle is. The computer doesn't know, um, you know, what it means to ask the question, am I going to hit something? We're going to have to dumb it down and explain each little tiny detail of those things. And that's something we're not practiced at. Even in terms of communicating, when we think about talking to a computer, computers need us to be completely unambiguous. When we talk to a computer, we have to, we have to talk to it uh, as if uh, it knows nothing. Whereas if we're communicating with a human being, which we're already very, very, very skilled at doing, um, we need to, uh, um, uh, you know, we're already very skilled at doing, we need to, we don't, we don't need to fill in all the blanks. If I was inviting somebody over to my house for a party, let's say, I could say, okay, yeah, you uh, go to Main Street, you know where that is? Uh, they nod and say, okay, you go like two or three blocks down, it's the second light. And you turn right there and I'm like the fourth or fifth house on the left, you'll see the pink car in the driveway. Some, something like that. A human being can fill in those gaps, okay? Computer's lost. It needs it to be specific, all the little details, all right? So because we're so good at solving problems and because we're used to being able to be relatively ambiguous with students, we have to retrain our mind to talk to a computer in those very specific um, ways. All right, so what's a programming language? Right tool for the job. This is a tool that allows a human being to tell a computer what to do. That's what it is. It allows us to still maintain our humanity in the way we're already thinking about how we solve problems. Because we don't want to have to tackle too many things at once. You know, the problem we're really trying to solve by becoming a computer programmer is how do I slow down my thinking and really articulate all the steps to solve a problem? That's what we're learning how to do. We're not learning Java or Python or C++. That part's easy. That's just syntax. Right, you know, how do you say the word boat in English versus Portuguese versus Spanish versus Telugu? You know, it's just syntax. It's got a word. There's a word that means that, right? So you, you know, you look up the word, you write the word. Um, but breaking it down and saying this is what this is the idea I need to get across, and then converting that to the language of choice, coming up with that idea is the is the hard part. All right, um, so. So programming languages, I mentioned this earlier, these are a human created tool. We cheated, we decided not to meet the, pro the computer halfway. With human beings, we usually have some form of fairness, right? You know, you know if you're, you're meeting somebody for uh, lunch, let's say, uh, and you live uh, 30 miles apart, you don't ask one of them necessarily to travel the full 30 miles to meet you. You meet them 15 miles in the middle, right? Like, ah, let's pick a place about halfway for both of us. You know, that's that kind of human idea of fairness. That's not how we work with computers. We're better than them, right? So when we're talking about computers, we're saying, okay, look, I'll tell you what, I'll come 1% towards you. And I'm being generous with that 1%. <laughs> I'm gonna, I mean, programming languages look intimidating initially, but like I just explained, the difficulty is not the language. The difficulty is how do we train our brain to articulate uh, the, the new solutions. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll deviate from English a little bit so that I can talk to the computer. Um, but I'm gonna still make you come 99% of my way. So if that's your friend meeting you for lunch, you'll walk out to the end of your driveway to meet them for lunch and then they have to pick you up. <laughs> they can take you wherever they're gonna take you wherever you're gonna go. All right, so, something like that. Um, now, you might say that, well, why did we even have to go the 1%? You know, why did we even have to uh, um, meet the computer that far? Why couldn't, just, why can't we just speak English to a computer? Well, the problem is, is that all of our natural languages, English, Spanish, whatever, these guys are all designed 
with human beings in mind. And human beings are very different than computers. We can fill in the gaps. We don't need the language to be unambiguous. Um, think about, uh, you know, when you're speaking to another human being, can't you say the exact same sentence and have it mean two or three different things, depending on how you, what inflections you use and your facial expressions and, and things like that, uh, which words you emphasize. So our modern natural languages are not precise. They're precise enough for human beings because we're amazing problem solvers. Even for those of you who think, oh, I'm always messing up. I'm not that great of a problem solver. I have trouble getting started. Well, by all measures, you're amazing at it. Maybe there's another human being that's a little bit better at it than you, but they're extra amazing. All right, something like that. So because human beings can fill in all the gaps, our languages don't need to be incredibly precise. In fact, as human beings, we rely on our languages to trade off some of that precision to be maybe a little bit more expressive. Right? When you're talking to a person, like for instance, if I muted myself here and I had, you know, I was going on and giving my thing, you know, my, my spiel and you didn't know, I didn't know I was muted. So I was going on for five or 10 minutes, just babbling and you don't even know what I'm doing. You could kind of tell just by looking at me, well, is he angry? Is he happy? Is he sad? Is he excited about what he's talking about here? Is he, is he uh, kind of, uh, you know, Whatever, you, you can just tell just by facial expressions and, and um, you know, just my, my movements, things like that, what I'm doing in general. There's whole portions of our communication that have very little to do with the words that are coming out of our mouth, right? And we take that for granted as human beings. Our communication protocols are so much more complex than programming languages. And we think, oh, well, I can never program. You know, I can barely speak English or I can barely, you know, speak whatever your native language is. You know, that's a lot harder. Programming is child's play compared to that, okay? So what's the real difficulty? It's we have to slow ourselves down because we're so good at solving problems. We've forgotten how to solve. We've forgotten how to tell people how we're gonna solve it. And if we can't explain how we solve that problem, we certainly aren't gonna be able to translate that into a programming language to tell a computer what to do. It's a problem, all right? And that's the skill you're learning as a computer scientist, not the stupid language. Python is easy, Java is easy. They're all, and actually, once you get into all the C-based languages, I mean, C, C++, Java, C-sharp, they all look identical because they all came from C. In fact, almost all of our modern languages came at some level from the C programming language, which was created in the late 1960s, okay? so. You know, it's not like the syntax in these languages are drastically different. You know, if you want to ask a question, you know, 99 out of 100 programming languages, you the way you ask a question is by starting with the word if. If some Boolean expression is true, do this stuff. There might be a curly brace in there. There might be a colon in there, a couple little weird symbols that are a little different between languages. But at the end of the day, they're almost identical syntaxes. An if statement's an if, an if statement. All right, so one thing I really like to emphasize with uh, computer programming is it's like, it's like a sport. Um, so I usually ask in class, you know, what's your favorite sport? And, you know, if I have uh, a lot of students from uh, India, for example, in class, you know, usually you get cricket. Uh, you know, you have uh, uh, the more global audience, maybe you get uh, uh, soccer or football, depending on what your country uh, uh, refers to it as, right? You know, in the United States, it's probably, you know, baseball or basketball or something like that. Well, soccer's become pretty uh, uh, pretty popular. We haven't quite embraced cricket yet. Um, but, you know, in any case, pick your favorite sport, whatever that is. You know, um, I'm an avid golfer now. I used to be a tennis player uh, a lifetime ago and I broke my back and I uh, got fat, but you know, it's a, but so let's pick golf as my example. I think I probably use a different example here. I took it from some other notes, but um, so golf is a, a, a pretty hard, let's call it sport. Some people don't want to call it a sport, but you know, you got this, this little ball that doesn't move, right? Yet it's infuriating. When you first take up golf, you, you swing and you miss, you swing and you miss. Then when you start hitting it, you're, you're not hitting it very well. It doesn't go the direction you wanted to go. You, you, it barely goes anyway, anywhere, you know, it's just really difficult. So you're taking lessons, right? 
And so I walk up, I say, okay, well, this is what the golf grip looks like. And, you know, here's a pitching wedge and this is how you hit a pitching wedge. And I go and I swing it and I make it look easy. And you're saying, okay, well, so the grip is like this. Does that look right? And I said, yeah, that's, that's right. It's like, well, I, and my stance needs to be like this. Yep, that looks good to me. And then you swing and you miss. Or you swing and it barely goes anywhere. You keep messing up and messing up. And I'm like, are you sure I'm doing this right? And I show you again and I make it look so easy. Well, when I first started golfing, I wasn't any good either. But what have I done? I've hit thousands and thousands and thousands of shots. I can show you day one academically how to grip the golf club and hit a pitching wedge. But until you've done it yourself a whole bunch of times, you put those reps in, you're not going to start getting the results you desire. Okay? Because academically understanding something is different than being able to use it in practice. Okay? I can academically teach you how to write an if statement or create a variable or write a loop. But until you've done it enough times where you kind of got, got the syntax, but you've also solved enough problems using those tools that you kind of know like, okay, I'm gonna need an if statement here because I need to ask a question about something. I only wanna do this to these two or three things if a certain thing is true. You need to have put those reps in. What ends up happening for um, uh, beginning programmers is they will understand the correct answer and be able to read somebody else's code significantly ahead of when they'll be able to write it on their own. You might spend four hours working on an assignment and not get it working, and then I come in and I solve it in two minutes. And like, that was it? Well, yes, that's the same thing as hitting that pitching wedge. Eventually, you'll solve it in two minutes as well, okay? You got to think about it like a sport. You have to put those reps in because again, what you're practicing is how do I think through this in a way that the computer is going to understand? How do I break this thing down into the little tiny baby steps that are required to accomplish the task? At first, you're going to turn the, oh, I just walked the class into four steps. And then those four steps will become eight steps. And then those eight steps will become 50 steps and so on and so forth. And as you get more and more skilled, you'll be able to get down to the level of granularity that you'll need to have in order to actually tell a computer what to do. All right, so how are we doing on time? I see you got about five minutes. Okay. Um, you know, so what I usually tell my students is don't freak out. Um, you know, so when you come into a computer programming class, you know, we have you take our programming the very first semester that you start the program. Because typically when you think about computer science, you're thinking about computer programming. Now, another truth is that computer science is not computer programming. Instead, computer programming is the tool that the computer scientist uses to solve our problems. Okay, so when you think about our different concentrations, uh, software engineering, AI, robotics, cybersecurity, you know, each of these fields are fields within computer science. We are solving problems related to artificial intelligence or related to robotics or related to, you know, large software development. And keep, understand that there's a lot more to so large software project development than, than just the programming. You know, you need to decide how am I going to divvy up tasks? Who's going to be in charge of what pieces of it? How do we make, you know, if we have five people working on five different parts, how do we make sure that those five parts will be able to talk to each other later on? You know, they, there needs to be a whole planning process for making sure that uh, your outputs fit with their inputs, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot more than, than just sit down and write code. Same thing with cybersecurity. We're solving problems related to the field of securing computer systems. Now, many times, one of our go-to tools that we use for solving those problems might be a programming language, right? Because we're gonna say, oh, I need to write some software that does X, Y, or Z. But the programming language is a tool. It's not the science itself, okay? Just like human beings, when we talk to each other with English, you know, the problem we're solving is not the English. We're saying, hey, do you wanna go grab lunch? Or we're saying, you know, hey, what time are you uh, uh, going to be at the school? You know, whatever it is. The pro we're, we're gathering information about a problem. If we're going to solve a more specific problem, like, you know, we're building a shed or something like that. Um, you know, we're working together and say, okay, well, why don't you uh, go ahead and dig up the dirt here for the foundation? 
um, and start mixing the cement, let's say, and then uh, I'll start building the sidewalls. You know, so you, you know, you're now solving the problem by divvying up tasks and now you're grabbing the right tools for the job. You know, the guy who's pouring the cement probably not going to need a hammer. The guy who is, can, you know, making the sidewalls is going to need that hammer. But the guy who's pouring the cement is going to probably need the hose to put some water into it. Uh, so you got to kind of grab the tools you're going to need to solve your portion of the problem and you're going to go and solve it and you're going to bring those solutions together to ultimately uh, uh, fix the problem.